The next speaker um, is one of my best friends. <laughs> I just met her, uh, <laughs> but she's now my best friend. Um, and uh, we'll just hand this over. She told me, don't, don't give a lot of introduction to me, because I'll brag about myself. <laughs> so Harriet, uh, okay. please continue. Thank you, Dennis. I, I appreciate being able to speak with you this morning. Um, I've been a public health toxicologist. My original discipline was physiology, and there's a natural progression. It's a really good background for toxicology to understand how cells, systems, organisms work. So since 1984, when I worked for EPA in their nascent indoor air quality program, and we first put together the uh, preliminary assessment of indoor air quality, which included a section on biological contaminants. Was, I've got a background in microbiology, so that was helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk about fungi, and molds is sort of the common word for it, such as weeds for those plants that we don't like. But uh, the kingdom fungi is extensive, its natural function is composting. If we didn't have that kingdom working for us, we would be eyebrow deep in dead plants and animals. So uh, we do not, however, want the composting of the built environment that's detrimental. And also to those that are exposed, it can be associated with health problems, some of which you've already heard about. So um, what's the issue is within uh, within bu buildings is when there is moisture, whether it's from water intrusion, whether it's from leaking of, uh, of pipes, or whether it's from lack of ventilation so that you get condensation. When you have enough water, microbes, especially molds and bacteria, will grow. And once you have that kind of an environment, it attracts things that eat the, uh, the microbes and uh, then they in turn get eaten, you know, small fleas have bigger fleas to bite them and so on and so on ad infinitum. So you get a whole eco ecosystem that can be detrimental to human health. So wet materials, as David Strauss mentioned, we tend to, building, to build our buildings out of dead plant material, which contains a lot of mold food and so when those things get sufficiently wet, you have both uh, fungal and bacterial spores that have come in from the outside that now germinate and begin to grow. And then uh, you begin to have proliferation of those microbes. And water availability is the primary thing which results in mold growth. And I worked for the Washington State Health Department for 12 years and got many calls from people who were having problems with water damage. And my mantra would be, if you see or smell mold, you have mold. The smell of mold means that something is actively producing metabolic gases, meaning that it's growing. But other things, uh, pH, temperature, and who else is there competing for those resources is important in determining what is going to predominate. So different mold species differ in their growth requirements. Uh, some grow with relatively small amounts of dampness and uh, others require a very large amount of water for long periods of time. The uh, temperature, and it just so happens that certain molds like the kind of temperatures that we like to live in, so that's helpful when they grow in our buildings. And then the presence of food. And then um, whether or not they survive depends who's in competition for the niche that they're growing in. So the niche, ecologically speaking, is what organisms do for a living. It's not the habitat. Okay. So it's a job that they do for a living, and they're competing for resources that are available in the building. But what happens then is that you build this ecosystem where there are different communities of organisms. They compete with each other, and there's a succession of organisms as conditions change. Because as the organisms eat the food that's there, 
then they themselves become food when they die and the, the substrate on which they're growing also changes as growth occurs. So you have, and then building moisture is usually episodic. Um, sometimes you have uh, bu buildings that are chronically wet, but because weather is one of the influences, you have rain and no rain, so buildings get wet and dry. And uh, if you uh, listen to some of the building scientists, they say when you build buildings, you have to provide a means that all buildings get wet. But if you provide a means for them to dry, either to the outside or to the inside, then you won't have fungal growth problems. Okay, um, so uh, David Strauss mentioned that we build our, our um, buildings out of, um, well, dead plants, essentially. And we also have new building products where we take wood, which generally only allows growth on its surface, and we chop it into what um, McGregor Pierce calls was wood. That's uh, um, uh, plywood, uh, orient oriented strand board, particle board, and so on. And the interesting thing about that is that you're crushing a lot of cells, you're creating a lot more surface area to which these organisms have access to the sugars and starches that are within the, the wood. And then also paper products are, was wood. And so these things get digested when they get damp or wet. So the substrate can also produce things that uh, are the result of mold contamination. So for instance, uh, Scopulariopsis brevicollis uh, can form organic nitrogen from inorganic and produce uh, arsine gas. Um, so uh, there was quite a discussion in the journal Nature about what killed Napoleon because indications were that he died of arsenic poisoning. Well, um, Napoleon had many enemies besides mold. And also he lived in an area, there's just a recent paper published, that uh, looked at hair samples not just from after he died, but hair samples from him and his family during his lifetime, and they contained arsenic. So um, there's a little iffiness now about whether this arsene could have killed him. He did die of arsenic poisoning. It may have just been the straw that broke the camel's back, this extra exposure, or it may have had nothing to do with his death and some other nefarious organism caused it. Botrytis cinerii uh, may produce benzyl cyanide. Again, so um, getting back to Napoleon, the arsenic was in the green flocked wallpaper, which was very, very popular in his era and was present in the house in which he was confined in, in St. Helena during his ex exile. So I left that part out. Okay. So, you know, we have, we have issues with things that result as, a, which come about as a result of the contamination, just not only the contamination itself. So what do the organisms themselves produce? Well, because they're living, just like we, they produce simple aliphatic alcohols, aldehydes, and ketones, and then some smelly things, um, just as we do, from digesting food. And those are primary metabolites. They don't seem to be causing us a lot of trouble, except some people are sensitive to some of their odors. But generally, if you smell alcohol, if you're not in a brewery or a bar, and you smell alcohol in a building, you have to have some suspicion that maybe there's excess growth of primary, me and primary metabolite release. The other things they produce are secondary metabolites. And these are not necessary for survival. So they're not necessary for energy production or making structural molecules or informational molecules but they may convey a competitive advantage, <coughs> excuse me, uh, such as antibiotic activity or toxic inhibition of competitors or a noxious smell or taste that triggers avoidance by predators. So 
so they produce these, they're expensive molecules, they're more complicated than the primary uh, metabolites, they're expensive in energy terms, so the organism doesn't necessarily produce them all the time. They produce them under some kind of stimulus, and so the question for us is, what is the stimulus? Uh, I'll come back to those molecules. What other things do microbes produce? Well, uh, molds, for instance, uh, digest externally. We ingest and then digest. They digest and then ingest. They put enzymes out into the environment, onto the substrate where they live, and they digest the starches, the sugars, and so forth. And then they absorb the resulting nutrients. Okay, they digest before they ingest. But those things are now out in the environment. And they can attach to particles which can be suspended and can be inhaled. I became interested in inhalation toxicology, especially since I was working in public health and in government, because inhalation is the one thing where government has an essential role to control. Because unless you leave the, th the space in which the air contaminant is, there is no way that an individual controls it. Okay? It has to be controlled on a general level. Uh, we can eat different food, we can drink different water when there are contaminants, but everyone breathes the air. And you breathe with every breath you take. A little song by the police. Okay. With every breath you take, you take in everything that's in the air. We don't have a mechanism by which we discriminate what we breathe in. So I felt that if I'm going to work with a regulatory agency, I ought to work with something that has a direct impact on being able to control that. Okay, so in addition to proteins, there are also structural molecules that are released when uh, spores and other structures of molds and, and bacterial cell walls are broken. So um, you have the beta-D-glucans, which are unique to the fungal, fam or the fungal um, genus. Uh, you have ergosterol, um, which is a, a, a fat. We, we don't have that. Uh, and then they also produce toxic or poisonous molecules. Uh, there's the endotoxins from bacteria, which are part of the cell wall and are only released when the bacterium ruptures. And then some bacteria also put toxins out into the environment. Um, and then the mycotoxins, which are um, more specifically defined as those toxins with effects on vertebrates, including humans, because they're toxic things that we call by other names when they affect bacteria or other molds. So for instance, we call a whole class of molecules antibiotics and we don't consider them toxic because their toxic effect is specific to other microbes. And we don't call them mycotoxins. Okay, so the proteins can be building blocks um, and are released when cells fracture or the enzymes are secreted out into the environment. And proteins can be allergenic for those who are atopic or capable of becoming allergic. Mycotoxins, or mold poisons, are exotoxins. And this is a very important consideration later when we talk about exposure, because they are not just in spores. They are not just in the mycelium. They are in both those places. But they're also on the substrate on which the organism is growing. Okay. Keep that in mind. Uh, they are relatively small molecules, as uh, Dr. Hooper and Dr. Strauss both mentioned. More than 300 mold species have been found to produce one or more toxins. And please also remember, one or more, some produce many. And we toxicologists tend to study things one at a time. And we don't tend to study the whole of the picture, but we make pronouncements about toxicity relating to an organism. Right, so they are defined as those that affect humans and other mammals. And the spectrum of toxicity can be highly potent, as uh, Dr. Hooper uh, said, 
where you have a lethal dose 50 of less than a milligram per kilogram. That's very, very small amount. And for inhalation, usually if you have inhalation exposure to toxins, those that have been done, they're, they're most, there are lethal studies, it's a 10 minute exposure and you look to see whether half the animals die within 24 hours after exposure. All right, 10 minutes exposure to a very low concentration and then you see whether you reach 50% um, mortality. And some of the examples, very Karen A and J, the satratoxins that are produced by um, Stachybotrys, the aflatoxins, and then others have a relatively low toxicity, relatively speaking, of 100 milligrams per kilogram. Again, short-term exposure. We've known about or got, we've known about mycotoxin exposure for a long time. This is a painting by Bruegel. It's called The Beggars. And at the time that this painting was made, poor people ate rye and rye bread. The wealthy ate wheat bread. But the poor were exposed to a mold, Claviceps purpurum, which produces the ergot alkaloids. And the ergot alkaloids have as one of their severe side effects dry gangrene, which then results in the loss of limbs. So rye bread eaters tended to lose fingers, toes, arms, and would be confined to begging because they could not make their living in any other way. And we knew it was associated back then with the consumption of rye bread and the rye bread could be seen to be contaminated because it was anywhere from pink to purple. Okay. In Russia, even in the 30s, you could find heavily contaminated rye bread, which was purple in color because Claviceps purpurum, purple, was the infectious agent. So we've known, but we've, we've thought that mycotoxin exposure was only through ingestion forgetting that many mold spores are cast into the air and can be inhaled, forgetting that, that spores and the mycelia fragment and these things can be cast into the air and they have mycotoxins associated, but most importantly forgetting that the toxins are out in the environment so anything they are attached to can also be put into the air and we'll come back to that. Okay, so molds differ in their ability to make toxins. Not all genera or strains are toxigenic. Um, and strains and, and um, species within a genus differ in their ability to make toxins. And the availability of nutrients, oxygen, water, and, <coughs> and the presence of competitors determine whether or not toxin production will occur. So what we know currently is that toxin production gives an ecologic advantage, which I've mentioned, a way in which to compete for the job that the organism does to stay alive. So the question is, if they um, don't always produce toxins, when do they produce toxins? And it has been said in a number of different venues that molds only sometimes make toxins implying that this is a rare event, okay? Um, and where that comes from is that if you isolate a mold from its natural environment and you grow it in pure talk in, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous, I don't know why. Maybe it's my six hours in the Seattle airport yesterday <laughs> waiting for the fog to clear, all right. So if you grow them in pure culture, they will stop producing those toxins after several generations. And you can think of this physiologically because if you don't have to expend the energy, if you have no one to compete with, why put your energy into making these molecules? But if you put them, if you have them in a mixed culture of microorganisms, whether they are other fungi or bacteria, then then they produce the toxins. And this is actually true of those bacteria that produce exotoxins as well. 
So when do toxigenic molds produce toxins? What are the conditions in damp or wet buildings? High water availability, so they get, will grow. Uh, ample availability of nutrients. And almost always, and I would really say always, mixed cultures of microorganisms, mixed cultures of molds, mixed cultures of molds and bacteria, and more recently discovered amoebae that grow as a result of the water activity, and they're all competing for the same resources. So now the, the organism that has the advantage will be the one that grows the most or survives. So they're competing for the same niche, and they're doing this through the production of inhibitory poisons. So um, this is a really common thing that happens out in our natural environment, and uh, other members of the ecosystem can be affected, although they're not targeted. So I've been quoted as saying that we get caught in the biochemical crossfire. Molds really don't have a consciousness of wanting to attack us, but we breathe the air into which their poisons are put. And so we then are also affected because the mechanisms, and this is what toxicology is based on, the reason we can study microbes, the reason we can study other mammals or, or other vertebrates and then make some projection to human effects is because fundamentally the kind of activities that, go, that occur within cells are common through living things. So, you know, we get caught, but we're not the target. And again, we're familiar with this kind of concept. Here's an aerial picture um, of California chaparral, and you see an area where there's no plants growing. The chaparral is over on your left side, and it has a, a compound in its leaves um, which inhibits other plant growth, okay? And these compounds are called terpenes. Terpenes, by the way, are the structural molecules from which tri trichothecenes are produced, all right? And what happens is that they put, as the leaves fall and get into the ground, they inhibit other plants. What's the thing they're competing for here is water. So if they can keep other plants at bay, there's a little more water for them to grow. We have periodic fires in chaparral. When that occurs, the terpene uh, burns away, and then you have universal growth. And those of you who have been in the desert have seen that when fires occur. Once they're gone, then suddenly you have this bloom, and you don't have these inhibited areas. And of course, all of us have seen this from our basic microbiology course. This is what Fleming noticed when he uh, accidentally dropped a mold onto a, a, a lawn of bacteria on a petri dish, that there was a zone of inhibition. These, of course, are antibiotic discs, and you see that the poison specific to this bacterium have various degrees of inhibiting their growth. So this is competitive inhibition made visible to you, and you've seen it many times. Um, some bacteria, Streptomyces, some bacilli uh, that grow in damp spaces uh, have been mixed. This is a very recent publication by Teubel et al. Um, out of Finland, is that when they grow in mixed cultures with molds, they also excrete toxins into the environment. And uh, the toxins that were detected uh, on building materials as a result uh, were, are listed here, and then chloramphenicol, which you actually know as an antibiotic, was found in settled house dust, which implies inhalation exposure possibilities. So I've already mentioned this, but let me reiterate. What is the location of mycotoxins? They're found in and on spores, and uh, the mycelium of producers. The mycelium is a cotton-like thing that you find in your refrigerator foods when you've left them too long. Um, they're found on fragments of those spores and mycelia and on small particles produced by the molds. More importantly, 
Toxins are secreted onto the substrate and are found on dirt and dust particles that can be aerosolized. And remember that exotoxins are secreted into the environment. The toxins are associated with very small particles. And uh, <coughs> uh, lab studies show that there are a large number of fragments in the first place and uh, fragments from 30 nanometers to about one micron in, di in diameter are released together with spores when the spores are kicked off their, um, their fungal source. Uh, as much as 500 to one fragments to spore ratio. That's a large number of fragments. And then uh, in field studies, in New Orleans, where they looked at smaller particles, they were found even greater ratios, depending on, on fragment size. So why is this important when we're thinking about exposure? Right, so they're not just on spores. They're not just on, in the mycelium. They're not just on fragments. But they're also in dust from the environment. Why is this important? Because small fragments are re re very easily re-entrained by building activity, by human activity in buildings. They're buoyant, they remain suspended, and when breathed, they penetrate deep into the lung as far as the terminal bronchioles, where you have very few defenses. You have no mucociliary escalator there, and you have few alveolar macrophages. So that's a very vulnerable area of the lung. And small particles have a very large aggregate surface area per unit mass. Now, it may seem counterintuitive to think that small particles have a larger surface area per unit mass than large particles, but uh, think of my fist as a tennis ball, right? And you can measure its surface, and you can weigh it, right? Now, cut it in half, and you weigh it again. You have the same mass, but you have two more cut surfaces. Now do that again and again and again and again and again until you get into the submicron range. And you have a very, very large aggregate surface area for the same mass. So EPA calculated that these clean diesel soot, which has an average particle size of 0.2 microns, has an aggregate surface area of 90 meters squared. And it's bigger than the ceiling that you're looking at when you look up. So why is this important? Because surfaces adsorb whatever else is on the surface, the, the substrate, or in the air. So the particle acts as a carrier, not just for mycotoxins, by the way, but for whatever else is there. So uh, you know, I've done air pollution in the ambient air as well, and studies have shown at the University of Washington, yay, uh, by the way, that um, when, you, when you burn uh, and you get soot particles, if you're, burning at the same, if you're burning sulfur at the same time that you're burning, so if you have coal and you're looking at particles from coal, if the, the coal contains sulfur, that sulfur dioxide, which is usually an upper airway irritant, suddenly becomes a lower airway irritant. Why? Because it adsorbs to the surface of the soot particles and gets carried deeper into the lung. So the fine particle uh, discovery that the toxins are associated with fine particles is extremely important from an exposure point of view. Right. Have we developed a really handy way of measuring that? No. But we haven't had a really handy way of measuring exposure to microbe products or even spores because we measure for such short periods of time and under such limited circumstances. I can go into that, but maybe not right now. The other thing, and this slide is courtesy of, of Dr. David Miller, is that when particles come down, they actually concentrate at the forks in the road. So it's not just a matter of the concentration in the air that's breathed, but it's a concentration of where the deposition occurs. All right, so um, toxin pr production by molds indoors. There are three conditions. 
uh, for Stachybotrys, Aspergillus, Ketomium, Aspergillus fumigatus, which you have heard about. Uh, the, they require a water activity of greater than 0.9. Uh, when they grow in mixed cultures of microbes competing for a niche and the substrate supports mold growth, you have toxin production. Uh, recently, a study in Europe, the HIT study, which uh, in these next slides are courtesy of Dr. Aino Nevelainen, from the, uh, retired from the Health Institute of Finland. Uh, this was done in the Netherlands, Spain, and Finland and they were screening schools, and they were screening for the occurrence of over 200 meta metabolites in indoor samples. And the sampling was both from mold damaged and control buildings and outdoor air, and uh, I'll show you some of the preliminary results. So uh, there were differences in frequencies of detection of the toxins. Uh, the origin, they were from indoor sources in settled dust, from school buildings in Spain, Netherlands, and Finland. Okay. And of those samples in all those different schools, 42 to 58 percent were positive for toxins of various kinds. There were differences in metabolites depending on where the samples were taken, but generally the the metabolites were found in greater concentration in contaminated or indexed schools. And there were some contaminants, some toxins that were related to what was outside and may have just been those that had been carried from the outside, where you have mixed cultures always, and are not part of the production of toxins from the indoor organisms. Um, so, uh, Teubel et al., which is also part of the study, uh, and it's just uh, published this last year, first reported bacterial exotoxins in naturally infested indoor samples. And they found um, uh, valinomycin, for instance, uh, being produced by, as a bacterial toxin co-occurring with fungal toxins. Okay, again, the idea that competition is what causes these organisms to, um, to produce the toxins. And this just, I'm not going to read you this in entirely, but you can see the different toxins in the, the fungal uh, columns, some of the bacterial, and in the um, nine buildings that were being investigated, how often they were positive. And it's a co-occurrence of these toxins. So, the, the summary of those data are that the big variety of bioactive molecules or metabolites and toxins were found in 18 Finnish schools and then others in Spain and the Netherlands. That uh, the prevalence of any single compound was relatively low. Um, however, there were statistically asso significant associations with the metabolite findings and the degree of damage in the schools. So I'm going to proceed now, and this is, these are the toxins that I think most important. This has not been um, laid down as, uh, as gospel by any learned body, but uh, since I was part of the learned body of the Institute of Medicine, Damp Indoor Spaces and Health Committee, um, I think I can make these, uh, these kinds of statements. So the reason I chose them was they produce very t potent toxins or produce many toxins with varied effects, or they're frequently associated with growth of producers in buildings, or the producers of these toxins are frequently found in wet or damp buildings, and there's a significant chance of human exposure considering the new information about small particles. Uh, uh, Christian Fogg Nielsen uh, actually also uh, chose these particular ones so you can see his review. Uh, at, there's a reference list in your, in your book with all the references. So Stachybotrys chartarum, Aspergillus versicolor, uh, Ketomium globosum and other Ketomium species already mentioned as a potential source of really serious health problems, and Aspergillus fumigatus. So Stachybotrys chartarum, 
Uh, the toxigenic species are highly cytotoxic, meaning that they are toxic to all cells that have been exposed in the laboratory. Um, the biomass from area where this mold is growing uh, is in higher quantities, has a lot of secondary metabolites. And uh, the strain S of Stachybotrys, which is 30 to 40 percent of all the isolates that have been evaluated across the world, produce highly toxic macrocyclic trichothecenes, satratoxin HG and F, iso F, roridin, and, and roridin L2. They're all potent inhibitors of protein synthesis. And then some others. And uh, in addition to that, all of the uh, strains produce different biocyclic dryamines, atronone and derivative, and simple trichothecenes. I differ in my pronunciation of that word, so I'm going to say trichothecenes. And stachylysin, a protein which, when mucous membranes are exposed to it, causes them to bleed. So uh, the other strain only produces those atronones that are not cytotoxic to macrophages, but they are inflammatory agent, and they cause a moderate inhibition of protein synthesis. They also produce the drymanes and uh, a lot of, or of molecules that have not been well analyzed. So what are the implications of uh, Stachybotrys tartarum toxicity? They're readily absorbed via the lung, so they carry throughout the body, and they are cytotoxic. So where they land, they will influence the life of that cell. Uh, protein synthesis inhibition affects repair of damaged tissues, so healing. It affects learning. Um, you can't produce ATP unless you have metabolic uh, uh, protein synthesis occurring. It produces enzyme production. It, pr it uh, is involved in antibody synthesis, which are proteins, and it's involved in growth. Right? Uh, it, it's involved, they are involved in immune disruption, an up and down regulation of the immune system. So it becomes very difficult with up and down regulation to determine exactly what's going on in a holistic way because some of the toxins that are produced by this organism upregulate, others downregulate, and so what's actually going on totally is difficult to determine, and the immune system is difficult to study. But in herd animals, exposure manifests first as an increased susceptibility to infection, and the infections last longer and are recalcitrant to treatment. Does that sound familiar? Um, okay. So uh, moving on to Aspergillus versicolor, this was mentioned by Dr. Strauss, together with Penicillium chrysogenum, is the most common species of indoor damp spaces. And it can grow in nutrient-poor substrates, even on concrete and plast uh, plaster. And it consistently produces large amounts of carcinogenic steric matocystin on water-saturated materials. Uh, Tuomi, another reference which I think I did not put at the end of, of my talk, uh, also says that when they have looked, they have found steric matocystin even when they did not find the penicillium chrysogenum in carpet dust. And it's consistently found in damp spaces. So uh, Engelhardt published in 2002 and found that steric matocystin was in 20% of household dust samples at levels up to 4 nanograms per gram dust. Um, steric matocystin is a precursor of aflatoxin B1, which is the most toxic natural molecule that we know. And it's transferred into carcinogenic form by cytochrome four P450, not only in the liver. The lung also makes cytochrome P450. Right. So what happens by, in cytochrome P450 is that, you know, we call it detoxification, but we lie. It's not detoxification, it's altering toxicity. In this case, it actually makes the molecule more toxic than when it is coming from the mold itself. It's also a strong inhibitory of tracheal ciliary movement. So it stops the, the mucociliary escalator, which means longer residence time. 
Right? And then it's highly inflammatory to lung cells. Ketomium globosum, uh, most common ketomium in dank buildings, uh, produces highly cytotoxic mycotoxins, inhibits cell division and glucose transfer, and it produces 10 other uncharacterized molecules whose toxicity we do not know. Aspergillus fumigatus, not generally thought of as a toxigenic mold, but this mold is infectious in immune-compromised individuals. So think about who all you might see who's immune-compromised. And then look at the next statement. According to Latke, who works for the Aspergillus group at the Pasteur Institute, it is currently the most prevalent airborne fungal infection in the developed world. Developed because we treat people with immune inhibiting substances in many instances and therefore they become susceptible to this, these um, compounds. Aspergillus fumigatus is commonly isolated in molding buildings, especially from dust. And as Nielsen said, it has an amazing arsenal of biologically active metabolites, including blah, blah, blah. And it uh, produces gliotoxin, which has already been addressed in a previous talk. So the question is, uh, are the mycotoxin from A. fumigatus a virulence factor for aspergillosis? The disease occurs primarily in immune-compromised patients but also in some uh, occupants of moldy buildings. And um, healthy hosts, macrophages ingest and kill this mold generally. Men many mycotoxins affect immune dis defenses, but also things like the mechanical defenses of the lung, uh, ciliary clearance, macrophage, and so on. A gliotoxin is the most abundantly produced mycotoxin. It suppresses immune function. It inhibits macrophage and PMN function, so it's host cellular defense. It produces fatal invasive aspergillosis in immune-compromised mice, and it's recovered from 93% of A. fumigatus cultures from cancer patients with presumptive invasive aspergillosis, according to a study by Lewis. Right. Uh, A. fumigatus also produces ergot alkaloids, and those of us who are uh, migrant nurse are thankful for ergot alkaloids, but generally we are not because uh, it has, a, has many effects on the nervous system that are not, um, not so favorable. So ergot alkaloids negatively affect uh, this uh, cere cerebrovascular, nervous, and reproductive and immune, cardiovascular, nervous, reproductive, and immune systems. The effects from indoor exposure to gliotoxin have not been studied. So, um, what's the role of these toxins and other respiratory disease? We know the toxic endpoints from in vitro and in vivo roles in damp building exposures other than for facilitating infection, these have not been studied. So uh, to some microbial interactions and toxin production, uh, on a microbial level, competition can affect secondary metabolites. On a human level, uh, increased production of toxins can have in synergistic effects on inflammation or increased immune disruption or can affect virulence or bacterial survival. Um, something recently discovered is that the uh, uh, um, amoebae that grow in damp buildings tend to sequester bacteria. That's what they normally feed on. So uh, Neglaria and uh, some, some others um, feed on bacteria and that's a helpful thing for us. However, recently discovered is that when the, uh, the bacteria are producing toxins, that the, um, that the amoeba only ingests the bacteria, and this was tested with um, legionellosis, with, with legionella, that the bacteria ingests the bacteria but does not digest them. And then at a later time when the amoeba is ruptured, it acts as a reservoir for the bacteria 
and there's a resurgence of the infection. So an interesting little thing recently discovered. So what about respiratory health? It's the most studied. You know, there's direct access. It's a route of entry. Uh, you can easily wash the lung and get all kinds of goodies out of it. Um, you can't do that for, um, for some of the other systems. So inflammation is a common denominator for both allergy and toxicity. Uh, allergic asthma is implicated for mold. Non-allergic asthma is also implicated for mold. And symptoms are similar. Inflammatory mediators are similar. IgE, allergic antibodies, do not have a role in non-allergic asthma. So let's look a little bit at that. Uh, um, Bill Fisk was a member of the DAMP committee. Uh, that is spelled with a P. And uh, the uh, Institute of Medicine DAMP committee did not do any quantitative analysis of the epidemiology that, they, that we investigated. But Bill went back together with colleagues uh, and looked at those studies that we considered in the IOM report, and they concluded that building dampness and mold is associated with 30 to 50 percent increases in a variety of respiratory and asthma-related outcomes. And what they say, consistent, relatively strong association of dampness and health effects strongly suggests causation by dampness-related exposures. And we in the IOM three years earlier, we stopped looking at literature in 2003, said research has not determined causal agents. And let me just say something about causality for a moment. Causality is an inference. What does inference mean? It is a judgment, a conclusion that's based on a body of epidemiologic literature. Right? So somebody says, enough. We have enough evidence, and I conclude that there is a causal relationship. There is no checklist, despite the so-called Hill criteria. Hill, in his 1965 publication, said, this is not a checklist. There are no criteria. These are some things to consider when you are making the inference of causality from epidemiologic evidence. Okay. So the other things that uh, Fisk et al. showed was upper respiratory symptoms increased 38% by those exposed, cough increased, wheeze increased by 80%, and they said the attributable fraction of current asthma to dampness and mold is 21% of asthma cases. That's pretty significant, right? When we looked at the data, we said there's insufficient number of studies for a conclusion of causality. However, there are a few more studies. I've listed them. They're in the reference list. And studies of new asthma of, of subjects exposed to, to, in homes and workplaces lead to a inference, a conclusion my inference, my conclusion, that exposure causes asthma. Um, other illnesses associated with mold and mold products, uh, sarcoidosis, various rheumatoid problems that have been studied in Finland, nervous system effects, immune dysfunction, eczema, lung hemorrhage in infants. And let's, for a minute, talk about limitations. You find no effect unless you look for it. So the study has to be specifically designed to be able to look, to connect the exposure with the disease. That's what epidemiology does. Right? Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In the IOM report, we were very careful to say no study and no effect is a different thing. You can't say no effect if you haven't studied it. Okay, so that has to be said. Um, association is always shown by epidemiologic studies, actually not only single studies, but the body of work, but the inference is a judgment call. So the difficulty that we have had is in measuring exposure. Doing spore counts does not give you exposure. And when, uh, when Fisk et al. did their study, and they looked at the same studies the IOM had considered. They eliminated studies that only had spore counts. 
because they said they were unreliable. You had to have other evidence of moisture and mold presence than only spore counts. And I don't have time to go into why spore counts are so problematical, but they did not use those studies that only had spore counts. Okay, so um, let's talk about biological plausibility. Uh, this is a, um, this and the following slides are from David Miller's work. And um, he was using genomics to try to make a connection. So uh, he exposed um, mice to, by, via inhalation, right, to a variety of different toxins and to beta deglucan. And uh, in concentrations that were um, normal in the built environment at relative, relevant doses when that built environment was damp. And they found with those toxins that they could, using heat maps, show what was happening in terms of expression of the genes that are related to asthma. Now what's important to know is that the mouse genome for asthma is almost identical to the human genome for asthma. So you can make inferences from mouse data and, uh, and extrapolate them to human data. So um, to, when you had exposure of the mice to particles containing the mycotoxins in question and to beta deglucan, uh, you can reliably estimate the concentrations based on EPA work. And that um, they, it was found that those substances activate the genes that are related to asthma in the mouse. And they activate them not only in atopic mice, but also in non-atopic mice. And let me now just back up for a minute to that list of references I, I gave you about the asthma studies, many of which were done by NIOSH scientists in the, in the workplace. And they found that when uh, uh, workers came into moldy buildings and they had not had asthma, they were healthy coming in, they developed asthma once they were in the moldy workplace, but they were not all atopic. A considerable num number of them were not allergic, and yet the asthma clinically looked the same. Okay? So if it's not allergy, then you know, with the choices we have right now, it's allergic, it's toxic. So then that's what got uh, David Miller looking at the toxic mechanism, and um, he found that in this study where you had the mouse genome being activated and you could actually quantify the exposure to concentrations that are normal to finding these substances within damp buildings, that you had responses in the mouse, the production of mucin, the production of uh, inflammatory cytokines, which are the things that you see clinically when you're examining the patient. Okay. So that gives you uh, an indication for a causal toxic role in non-allergic asthma. Okay. And that's what I have to say and we'll discuss later. Thank you. Thank you.